Welcome to Pastor Emily's Story Hour. My dad wrote the short story that I'm going to read for you today. I remember him reading it to me when I was almost too young to understand it, but it was always my mom's favorite story of his. Patterns by Doug Finn. Martha Noel sat on the middle cushion of her small brown couch, watching the black and white images flicker across the television screen. There was talking, too, but it was remote and didn't concern her. She had lost track of the program long ago, and her mind, as it seemed to do so often, had backed away from the present into the past. She was thinking of her husband now, and the small green house on a short street in Bloomington. He came home with flowers that time, and held them up to her with hands stained greasy from the last automobile he had worked on at the service station. She took them gingerly, with a finger and thumb, because the stems were greasy too, and put them in a glass of water. Some of the grease slipped off and floated to the surface, making little rainbows that they had both pointed to at the same time. She couldn't remember what kind of flowers they were, or even what color. Since her stroke, there were a lot of things she couldn't remember. It annoyed her. Sometimes she would be talking to someone, like that nice young man across the court, and what she was going to say would just slip from her mind like jello out of a mold and slither away. She would remember it later, when it was too late and didn't matter anymore. She lived in Arizona now. They had moved here and bought a house after her husband sold the service station because of his emphysema. Her husband. His name was gone from her memory temporarily. The illness took all the money. They sold the house and moved into this trailer. There were only the two of them. There had always been just the two of them. And Clarence. That rascal. Where was he? She stood up slowly. Her legs pained her lately. She didn't walk much, seldom moved out of her trailer except to walk down to the mailbox, water the grass, and to call Clarence. That's when she usually saw that nice young man. He was going to college. He was going to be an engineer. She hobbled down the steps of her trailer, bracing herself on the wooden handrail the old owner had built for her. It wobbled now. The grass in her tiny front yard was shaded by a huge mulberry tree. The new owner said he wouldn't care if all the trees died. They used too much water, he said. But she watered hers once a week, even when it rained, and the grass, too. She looked around her, then across the court. That nice young man wasn't out today. Only the old man next door, whom she had seen before from her window, who was always out, sitting in a canvas lawn chair, drinking vodka from a bottle in a paper sack. Clarence, she called in a high falsetto voice. Clarence! A large, steel-blue Siamese cat crept out from beneath the trailer. She smiled. She knew he wouldn't have gone far. He walked slowly, stiffly, it seemed to her, although she couldn't see him very well with those tired old eyes of hers. He hobbled straight ahead, as if he would go under the next trailer, and she called again. Clarence! You rascal! Come over here! He stopped as if puzzled, turned slowly in her direction, then walked into the tree. She went to him, wondering and afraid, and saw that his eyes were two fiery red balls bulging out of their sockets. Clarence, she whispered, and picked him up tenderly, stroking his fine, soft fur. Clarence, what happened? She held his head facing her side. She didn't want to look at the eyes. Even standing in the shade from her tree, she felt the heat of the summer day oppress her. What is it, Clarence? she murmured. What's the matter? She looked around her again then walked as quickly as she could across the hot gravel court to the young man's trailer. She knocked on his door. It took him a long time to answer. There was music going on inside, that new kind of rock music, they called it, and the knocking hurt her knuckles. Finally, he opened the door. 
It's Clarence, she said. Something's happened to him. He looked at the cat, saw the eyes, and his own eyes widened. The young man's eyes were dark, shaded by heavy brows. She had always thought him handsome. He ushered her out to his little car, helped her into the seat, and drove her to the veterinarian. The doctor looked at Clarence, felt around a little, asked her some questions, then said, He's had a stroke, Mrs. Knoll. She didn't know what to say. She looked down at Clarence, lying on the stainless steel table, breathing lightly, and resisted the urge to run her hand down his back soothingly. He had been with her so long, and she talked with him in such familiar terms when they were alone that now, with the doctor and the young man standing there, she didn't know how to act. Finally, she looked up at the doctor. Is he in pain? she asked. I don't think so, the doctor said. The only permanent damage seems to be in his eyes. He'll get used to that. They left the veterinarian, and the young man drove her home. While he was helping her out of the car, she thanked him for taking her. That's okay, the young man said. You going to be all right? I mean, that's kind of a blow. She smiled. He was nice. Yes, she said. I'll be all right. Thank you. Oh, if you need anything, let me know. She went back to the trailer and sat down on her couch in front of the television. Clarence lay in her lap and she stroked him gently. I don't know about you, she muttered. A stroke. All my men get sick. You hear me, Clarence? I understand how it is. You hear me? It was the same with Frank. That was her husband's name. She had known it would come to her. His friends called him Noli, but she called him Frank. He was a good man, Clarence, just like you. You hear me, Clarence? Frank's funeral was the first time she had realized the emptiness. There were only a few other people there, mostly neighbors from their old neighborhood before, before they sold the house. She hadn't seen any of them for years now. Mabel's daughter had come once a week for a long time to take her to the grocery, but then she went off somewhere to college. Then she heard that Mabel had died. Mabel was one of them, at the funeral, and that old minister with a southern accent who gave such a nice service. It was July. The summer rains had just begun. Above her the sky was clear, a light, transparent blue, but there were black clouds hovering over the mountains, and a rainbow arching through the clouds. She saw it as she walked away from the service across the soft grass. It made something well up within her. No one else had seemed to notice it. After a while, Clarence learned to get along with his sightless eyes. She watched him walk through the trailer along the wall, using his whiskers to feel his way. She still came, he still came when she called him, although it took him longer, and he spent more time sitting on her lap, letting her pet him and scratch his ears and talk to him. Then one day she creaked up from her place on the couch and hobbled down the steps. She stood in the yard and called him, but he didn't come. Clarence, she called again. You rascal, where are you? She looked under the trailer. It was a strain to bend her knees and back that far, but he wasn't there. She thought she had let him out, but knew she could be wrong. She was forgetting more and more lately. She struggled back up the steps and began a methodical search of the trailer. Clarence, she called. Clarence! She thought he might be under the bed, but she didn't know if she could get down that far. In the bathroom. It wasn't a big trailer. Clarence! And there he was. And then she remembered, in the living room, on the other side of the television where she couldn't see him. But she had seen him before. But she had thought she had let him out. He was panting, with his red eyes open and bulging. Clarence? she said softly. She knelt down and smoothed back some ruffled fur. You rascal, she whispered. She picked him up and cradled him in her arms. At the door to the young man's trailer, she said, I don't think he hears. He wouldn't move. He drove her to the veterinarian. 
and the doctor spent a long time poking and listening with his stethoscope. He snapped his fingers in front of Clarence. Then he clapped his hands. Clarence only panted. I'm afraid he's had another stroke, Mrs. Knoll, he said finally. She reached out her hand and smoothed the fur on Clarence's back. His back was stiff. He was old and stiff. He's paralyzed, the doctor went on. He won't be able to eat, and, and his... She nodded. I know, she said. I understand. The doctor went into another room, and then came back with a needle. Wait, she said. She picked up Clarence's soft, stiff body, held him close to her, and nodded. The needle plunged into Clarence's side. His body quivered slightly, then slumped over her arm. Back at the court, the young man helped her out of his car, and again she thanked him for taking her. There was a strange, pained expression on his face. He had been tensely quiet on the way home. I'm sorry about the cat, he said softly. Thank you, she said. I'll be moving pretty soon, he looked at the ground. To L.A. I got a job at Lockheed. That's wonderful, she said, and smiled. He took a nervous breath. Well, if you need anything, let me know. Thank you, she said. She put her hand on his arm. I will. For a while, she watched the television flicker in front of her, not heeding it. Then she got up and struggled down the set steps to set the sprinkler to water her grass. She picked two small wild daisies that grew just under the trailer where the sun hit them in the afternoon. When she went back inside, she would put them in a glass of water. Then she positioned the sprinkler carefully in the center of the grass and turned on the water. There was a quiet gurgle, then a hiss, and the water shot up in a fine spray. In the middle of the spray, barely perceptible to her tired old eyes, was a small part of a tiny rainbow.